Well, good morning, Willows family and friends. We hope that this Labor Day weekend finds you able to pause from your labors. And of course, it's also the last weekend before school begins again. And so we want to share a prayer of blessing from local author Sarah Bessie for the children and youth returning to classes. As we head back into classrooms, may you go forth fully convinced of our love and your capacity. May you be the head and not the tail, leading others and yourself on a path of flourishing. May your roots go deep down into God's soil so that you will bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May you remember your people, where you come from, and find your place of belonging. May you become even more fully who you were always meant to be this year. We pray that you would sow seeds of life and hope wherever you find yourself, cultivating a harvest of shalom. May you be prepared for every good work that lies ahead of you. May your mind be clear and engaged, your memory sharp, and your wisdom beyond your years. May you be safe, beloved child, protected from anything that seeks to steal, kill, or destroy in any measure. And when disappointments or disasters come, and they will, may you find the depths of resilience we already see in you and rise, rise, rise again. We pray that you would be a blessing to your teachers and the school staff, and we pray that they in turn would see and affirm you in the fullness God has created. We pray for good friendships that will sharpen and delight you. And we pray that you would have eyes to see the lonely ones. May you have many opportunities to practice being brave and kind. Beloved child of God, we send you out in the power and peace of love itself, prepared and anointed, knowing you walk upon steady ground. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God and mother of us all. Amen. Amen. Sweetest songs of victory, your grace. 
privilege. This is a phrase and a concept that has gained significant traction since about 2014. And there's an understanding that privilege is the unearned access to social power based on membership in a dominant social group. It's defined as a special right, an advantage or immunity granted, assumed or available only to a specific person or group of people. And we all have varying degrees of privilege. And while some aspects can change throughout our lifetime, mostly it's based on factors like gender, race, geography, ability or disability, and the socioeconomic realities. And that our experiences of privilege or marginalization are part of our lived reality. The concept of checking your privilege raises awareness of the diverse experiences of others. And this has a lot to do with the concept of stewardship. It can be used or misused, our privilege, and so we need a model of living and dealing with it well. Privilege can be exploited to maintain your own hold on power at the expense of others, gaining uh, the advantage of sitting right on top of the heap and being blind, really, and immune to the troubles suffered by the marginalized. And the concept and label of privilege can also be weaponized dismissing others and their different perspectives into adversaries that are meant to be torn down and silenced. But it's also possible to employ privilege in solidarity with those who are disadvantaged, to serve their needs, to make space for their voices, and to create opportunities for them to flourish. In our new sermon series on A More Christ-Like Way by Brad Jerzak, we are walking through the facets of a more beautiful faith outlined in his book. The first facet is a radical self-giving. And the author notes that if we pay close attention to Christ, we recognize through the incarnation how Jesus used privilege, how he set aside privilege, and even how he assumed real disadvantage. Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11 is an early hymn that the Christ followers would sing together based on this theme of humility. 
Christ, though in God's form, did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself and received the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of humans. And then, having received human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death. Yes, even the death of the cross. And so God has greatly exalted him and to him in his favor has given the name which is over all names. That now at the name of Jesus, every knee within heaven shall bow on earth too and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Undoubtedly, Jesus enjoyed the built-in privilege of equality with the Father, an heir of God's universal kingdom. And this privilege didn't make him feel guilty. He didn't despise who he was or the great advantage of his majesty. But Jesus knew that privilege wasn't something to exploit for himself. He saw that the privilege of sonship, those things were to be used to serve others, to rescue the afflicted, and to raise up humanity with and in himself. Christ embraced and united himself to humanity. N.T. Wright translates this idea from Philippians as emptying himself. And in the Greek, it's the word kenosis. The text doesn't say that something was emptied from or out of Christ. It's not a what, but rather a who. Jesus Christ is emptied into the world as self-giving servant love. This doesn't make him any less God. Rather, this kenosis reveals the very nature of God. The suggestion is that the emptying himself is really a setting aside of privilege. If anyone has been accused of having privilege, surely it's God. Humans rail at him. You don't understand. You don't know what it's like to be human. You're God. You, you are all powerful. And God's answer to that accusation is the incarnation. When Jesus took on human likeness, he didn't just become similar to us. Rather, he identified so thoroughly that he became us and like us in every way. We read that in Hebrews 2, verse 17. This includes all that we suffer. He was exempt and immune to nothing that is intrinsic to the human condition, not even death. And so Jesus can sympathize and empathize with our weaknesses, our bewilderment, our frustrations, our hunger and thirst, our aches and pains. Jesus came to know by direct experience all of the realities of growth, of submission and obedience in setting aside divine privilege, even to the point of suffering and death. He certainly wasn't born with that silver spoon in his mouth or daddy's platinum card. He didn't ride on the coattails of nepotism. Jesus identified so completely with humanity that his divine life would mysteriously heal and transform us. He went to the depths of the human condition and raised us up with himself. Any direct privilege that Jesus of Nazareth enjoyed as a Jew or a male or a freeborn person was really offset by the rather scandalous circumstances of his birth. He was born in the back country town of Bethlehem. He was then taken to Egypt as a refugee and then finally brought up as a blue collar worker, carpenter in the hill country of Nazareth. He was part of the oppressed Jewish people under the Roman imperial occupation. In his ministry, he became the ally to the poor, a healer of the sick and a friend and advocate of those sinners. Jesus went beyond his willingness to set aside privilege, and he actually assumed real disadvantage, identifying with every victim who has been falsely accused, unjustly incarcerated, and wrongly executed. Descending to the lowest of the low, he endured the same pitiable fate as the criminals, 
who mocked that he saved others, but he could not save himself. There would be no 11th hour intervention if his self-giving kenosis was real. If Jesus had not experienced true weakness, it would have just been a sham, a pseudo incarnation. Like every person before and since, Christ's vindication counted on the faithfulness of Father God. And Jesus had to wait for justice after death. The final word is not a tomb, it is resurrection. And the Jesus way includes a call to set aside privilege and the Jesus way involves a cross. If we exploit our privilege, clinging to it, using it as a weapon against others, we will suffer loss in the end. Those who lay aside privilege and follow the Jesus way through the cross and beyond the tomb will hear the voice of the one who really matters, trusting only in God's faithfulness to resurrect us. Philippians 2, 15 to 17 continues with Paul exclaiming this call to lay aside privilege and live like this. That way, nobody will be able to fault you and you'll be pure and spotless children of God in the middle of a twisted and depraved generation. You are to shine among them like lights in the world, clinging to the word of life. That's what I will be proud of on the day of the Messiah. It will prove that I didn't run a useless race or work to no purpose. Yes, even if I am to be poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I shall celebrate and celebrate jointly with you all. Just as Christ was emptied into the world as humble love, so Paul is poured out like a drink offering in collaboration with the sacrificial love of the Philippian church. There is a scene, a drama, a play that is acted out in scripture on the night of the Last Supper of Jesus and his disciples. And this foot washing drama, you might recall, is full of radical love and extreme humility which summarizes Christ's entire mission of love. Perhaps Jesus knew the object lesson he was using, or perhaps he was so intuitive that it all just flowed unconsciously. John has recorded it in scripture with seven steps or actions that might even be called seven signs. Here we go, let's take a look at them. Jesus got up from the supper table like the sun rising from his seat at the right hand of the Father in glory. Next, Jesus took off his clothes. And so without ceasing to be divine, Christ also laid aside this divine privilege. He emptied himself. Next, Jesus wrapped a towel around himself, like the word becoming flesh and taking up the human condition in the form of a servant. Jesus next poured water into a bowl just like pouring the living water as a spring from his own life out into the world. Jesus then began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he was wrapped in, imitating how he washes us clean of stains of sin, the ashes of sorrow and the dust of death. Jesus then puts on his clothes, just as he's modeling this ascending to the cross, being crowned, enthroned, glorified, and revealed as the Son of God. Having laid down his life, he takes it up again, resurrected, and ascended to the heavens. Finally, Jesus sat down again, and at the Father's right hand from now, where he rules the universe by the means of unfailing mercy. So this object lesson Jesus then instructs his disciples to imitate him. Do you understand what I have done for you? Do we understand? This is the self-emptying, canonic love that Christ left his throne, set aside privilege, stooped down from heaven, humbled himself to death to wash humanity clean. If I, as your master and teacher, washed your feet just now, you should wash each other's feet. I've given you a pattern 
so that you can do the things in the same way that I did to you. John 13, 12 to 14. This traditional event of Maundy Thursday, this foot washing, comes with a new command, really to pay it forward. Love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And everyone will know this, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 34 to 35. As Christ followers, we need not just be working up our faith and our convictions so that we are solid and firm on what we believe. It is about imitating the faithfulness of Jesus in voluntarily laying aside privilege and taking up the towel of self-giving love. It's by grace that we imitate Christ. To do that, of course, we must first let him wash our feet. We must allow Jesus to wash our feet of all that is against love so that even the world would say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We need to be loved to the end. We need to recognize that his love would fill our hearts, our eyes, our hands, ridding us of all malice, of all resentment, of all bitterness. Those things need to be washed away. Jesus trusted the faithfulness of his father completely. That's how he could surrender his privilege, his status, those perks. And only in trusting the faithfulness of God completely will we be able to imitate Jesus. Here are a few reflection questions for you to think about today. What privileges do you normally enjoy and assume without giving it a second thought? If we are called to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, what things can you do that would raise up others? Can you use privilege, set aside privilege, or even adopt disadvantage as Christ did for the benefit of others? And if you were to imagine Jesus washing your feet, is this as awkward and as hard for you to receive as it was for Peter? What do you think within you is being challenged in your ego when we resist such grace? Let's end with a final prayer together. Humble servant king, today I open my heart and even my feet to your cleansing touch. Wash away my pride, cleanse every stain of ill-gotten or misused privilege, and make me a Christ-like steward of all the gifts I've been given. Empower me to be disempowered and to know the joy of self-giving love. Amen. How great this love Oh, it's moving on my mountains This perfect love Is casting out my fear How great this love Oh, it welcomes me like family
I say. 